our, uh, our other co-chair, um, Bill Scott, uh, was up on the hoist today, getting uh, a new hip. Under the knife. Under the knife. Well, a new hip from old hip, so uh, uh, his wife Sue's here, and apparently uh, Bill's up and well. And no, he's not a cop. He's not well, he's well. He's actually, he's running the hospital now. So we, uh, <laughs> um, hope everybody had a good summer. We had a busy one with the Allendale Neighborhood Association. Uh, we have a, our bike petitions over here that you can still sign. Uh, there's also an email list that you can sign for as well. You can see uh, we're still working on new signs for the historic neighborhood strategy. Um, uh, this is sort of what we're at right now. Um, uh, some other things that have happened. Uh, you know, our county councilor Jennifer Robinson uh, stepped down from council. And a number of people put their names uh, in the hats. It would actually be quicker now uh, to put your hands up if you're not running. <laughs> 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 you know? So there are seven people, including myself, Colin Wilson, who is our vice chair. Uh, I don't know if anybody else is in the room who is, I honestly. Uh, there, but there's seven people right now. So, uh, But that's not the point that we're here for today. We are here today uh, for a town hall meeting. Uh, Mayor Jeff Lehman is here, graciously accepted our invitation. Also, uh, we weren't sure he was going to show up, but Councillor uh, for Ward 9, Brian Jackson, uh, former Mayor of Minnesota, is also here today, and we're expecting uh, Ward 2 Councillor uh, Lynn Strong, who uh, also comes as part of the Allendale area. Um, hopefully, Councillor Strong will be here. She said that she would probably be a little late. She, uh, she has a, a, a previous engagement. So, uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to His Worship, Mayor Lehman. Actually, you know what? Uh, <laughs> Peter Boltes, who is our gracious host, as always, uh, here at Unity Christian High School. Peter, if you want to uh, do the benediction. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's great to have you here. Some of you were here on Friday afternoon. We had the um, Islanddale Family Fun Fair on Friday. And we had hot dogs and that kind of stuff. We want to be as good a neighbors as you are to us. That's the key. Uh, we've enjoyed being here for a couple of years, and uh, I understand our kids uh, do well here. I heard from a number of people that our kids are, are enjoyable kids. I know that. They're wonderful young people. And so thank you always for the, the, the welcome that you have sent us, and we're more than grateful and more than happy to uh, welcome Allen and Lincoln Association to our school every month. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Jeff Lehman and the Councilor Jackson who wants to join us at the front of the floor. I have a music stand for podium I'm going to do. And thank you Councilor Jackson for being here as well. Um, folks, if it's alright with you, I thought I'd just talk for maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and uh, But leave lots of time for questions and back and forth because that's what this is all about. Um, and I, I really do appreciate uh, all the people that come out to town halls. This is actually our 16th town hall meeting since the start of this council term uh, 19, 20 months ago. Um, one thing I said uh, when running when we first started in council is that we had to open up uh, City Hall and get people more involved in the decisions that affect their community. And one of the things that we have been doing to do that is holding town hall meetings like this one in every ward around the city. So I've been to all 10 wards in 2011, and we are making our way through all parts of the city again here in, in 2012. Um, in uh, August, I was in Ottawa for the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference. That's where all the mayors and councillors from cities all over Ontario get together uh, and there's about 2,000 people. Uh, they exchange best practices. There's a lot of meeting with provincial government because most of the provincial cabinet also goes to that. Uh, and it's often an opportunity to kind of advocate for Barry. But it's also de rigueur for all three of the leaders of provincial parties to address the assembled um, councillors and mayors. And uh, Dalton McGinty got up and he spoke. And what he said when he started was, uh, he was talking about being in campus casing. And he said he was standing out um, in campus casing and, and a guy came up beside him and he said, did anybody ever tell you you look just like Dalton McGinty? 
and he said to the guy, uh, yeah, I get that all the time. <laughs> and uh, Dalton McGinty, uh, or the guy said to him, doesn't that bother you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I had somebody say that to me the other day, too. He looked just like the mayor, and I really didn't want to go through that. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, you know, I'm the mayor. Um, my job on paper is the head of council and CEO of the municipality. Um, my job in practice uh, is about building a better community, and that means making it safer, uh, making it more prosperous, managing our money well, and making good decisions as council. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about where I think we are with, with those things. Um, I think most of you would probably agree with uh, police and fire and so forth, the key responsibility for the city uh, and uh, managing our uh, resources and um, preventing crime is a huge issue for us in Barrie. And one, one thing we have seen over the past few years is actually quite an amazing situation. Um, crime is down, believe it or not, by 21% three years, uh, we have seen a really dramatic reduction, and as the Toronto Star reported recently, our city is the fifth safest of all the big cities in Canada. Um, that being said, we've seen an ongoing increase in calls for service to the very police, uh, which is one of the ironies of society today. Um, increasingly, our police and emergency services are called on to do much more than just battle crime, or in the fire department's case, battle fires. Um, they are called on for emergent situations of all types and, and often uh, non-criminal situations such as noise and, and violent infractions. So it's a constant challenge for the police to maintain a response, to go out every time they're called by somebody who says, my neighbor's stereo is really loud, can you come and tell them to turn it down? Um, and still do the job that they're there for primarily, which is keeping our community safe. But I feel like there has been some progress because uh, we have good numbers terms of safety in our community and crime in our community, and they seem to be going in the right direction. But safety, community safety is a much bigger thing. Um, speeding in residential neighborhoods is a major issue. It's a problem in many parts of the city. Uh, it's a problem in lots of cities. But particularly in ours, because we are a newer city and many of our roads have been designed for cars, fast travel, rather than what they are often in residential neighborhoods, which is a combination of places that kids play, places that events happen, people use in other ways than just driving. So one of the things this council did uh, early on was to start a traffic calming program. And people love it and hate it, because it's those speed bumps that are there. Uh, and it's also other measures which are surprisingly effective. Those radar speed boards that you see around our city that say your speed is, there was one out here on Burton, I think it might still be there over by Bayview. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't match what your speedometer tells you. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting when you drive, them, especially on Livingston, where there's two or three, because that's a really busy road. Burton's very busy as well. Um, and uh, unfortunately, now and again, we get some people who try and rack their score up, uh, <laughs> which is exactly the wrong approach. But it's part of a broader effort. Um, the traffic calming through the radar speed boards on major roads the temporary speed cushions, we call them, which are those speed bumps that are actually picked up and moved around the city to hot spots that are identified by the local councillors in each of the neighborhoods. And, in fact, increased enforcement by the police. And if you're counting, and again, I don't know whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but they have written about 50% more tickets this year than last year, mostly on that blitz of school safety zones uh, that occurred over the last three weeks. Uh, that's been the real push in the last two or three months. But throughout the year, there's been much greater enforcement when it comes to uh, speeding and highway traffic act infractions and barrier. So that's the safety side. On the bigger picture, though, on what keeps us and will, will keep us strong as a community, which is jobs and our prosperity as a city. Um, the recession hit Barrie as it hit many other communities. Um, we uh, actually fared pretty well in the early days of the recession. Uh, but we got hit particularly hard towards the end of it, uh, in late 2009 through 2010. Unfortunately, unemployment is something that often trails a recession. People, when they first lose their job, may sometimes go back for training. Uh, they're supported by EI, or they may continue in a, a part-time kind of capacity. But then that uh, wraps up. And uh, we actually, last fall, had a real spike in the local unemployment rate. It was hard to miss in the local media. 
Since then, the rates come right down. Uh, it's now in the eight point something range, which is around what the provincial average is. But those are statistics. The real impact on people uh, often is the nature of the employment, the quality of the employment, whether it's permanent, uh, whether it's a living wage, uh, whether it is something that they can rely on or is at the whims of, of the economy. Um, one of the signs that I've seen in 2012 that I feel is most promising, I grew up uh, in Elmdale Heights on Hillcrest uh, Road. Um, and I can remember riding my bike around the area, the Bayview area, out to Radio Shack once I was old enough, my parents let me. Uh, but I would chase the uh, hot air balloons. Anybody remember the hot air balloons in the early yeah, 80s? Yeah. You used to chase the hot air balloons out to Molson Park, and once I got old enough, I could go out there and watch them go up. And, and you know, the plants, the, the factories out there were full. There weren't a lot of vacant ones. There are a lot of vacant ones now. But the lights have gone back on at two of the biggest ones. Uh, at the Bemis building on Fairview, we saw PPG relocate to Barry from Toronto. They're a glass uh, company. They actually came right from downtown Toronto, the foot of the Don Valley Parkway, up to Barry with their workforce. Uh, filled about half the building. <coughs> And Wolf Steel has taken the other half of it. So it's now full again, the lights are back. In the Foratia Auto Parts plant, uh, many of you may remember it closing along with a few other auto parts plants, VW and Barry over the years. Foratia has been purchased by McLean Engineering. They make heavy mining equipment, big giant bulldozers and loaders, specialized equipment for the mining sector in Ontario, at West, and even internationally. They do a lot of work in Chile. And when we were meeting with them about bringing them to Barry. One of the things that interested them was they thought they could find some Spanish-speaking sales reps in Barry. Really interesting. Uh, anyway, they are maintaining their presence in Owen Sound in Calgary, or uh, Collingwood, excuse me, big difference there. In Winnipeg, Ontario. <laughs> anyway, um, in uh, Collingwood and Owen Sound where they are today, but they are expanding and building this new facility which will be head office, research and development, warehousing, and a few other functions here in Barry. And there have been other examples, plastics company from Brampton called R&M Plastics and, and, and others. Uh, particularly promising, I think, is the expansion of the great companies that have survived Recession 1, Recession 2, Free Trade 1, Free Trade 2 in Barrie, like Wolf Steel, um, who uh, are adding 200 people this year, next year, to build furnaces. They designed a new high-efficiency furnace, a very small unit, uh, with some help from the federal government, and uh, they're now going to build those here in Barrie. So there are signs that we are seeing a little bit of strength once again in our manufacturing sector. It's not going to be what it was, I don't think. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be what it was anywhere in Ontario. But we need to be doing absolutely everything we can as a city to try and support it, the expansion of the manufacturing sector that we do have here and continue to attract the investment we can. The other really exciting side of what's going on in our economy is the burgeoning professional services and the data centers. Uh, right here in Ward 8, uh, we opened the doors on the IBM Data Leadership Center on Friday. That one is very exciting, but maybe not for the same reasons. Um, it's only only 20 jobs, and I don't think even one job is anything to sneeze at. Uh, they're very, very good jobs, but it's not numbers. But the impact of that facility on our community is tremendous. Something I learned on Friday from IBM is that both Bell and Rogers upgraded their fiber optic trunk. Uh, to Barry for that project. So our entire community has more bandwidth now than it did before that happened. And that means other companies can take advantage of that increased capacity and we as Barry have an advantage in attracting uh, more similar tech firms to Barry. And obviously a brand like IBM, a company like IBM, uh, choosing your city over 15 others uh, should inspire some confidence and, and hopefully gain some attention. So I think there are positives out there. I think we're still struggling with the after effects of the recession. I'm an economist, so uh, I'm a really boring dinner guest. And um, I will tell you that it feels right now to me like the early 90s. Um, you know, there was a very uh, tough recession uh, in the early 90s. It was a property-driven uh, recession rather than the financially-driven one that we had this time. But it took a long time to recover. And in some ways, I think employment in Ontario and in Canada will take a long time to recover. But we're recovering, and there certainly seem to be some positive signs as, as a community. Um, there are many other things going on, and on this broader agenda of, of 
keeping us prosperous and, and being ready for the new economy, you've probably seen a lot of push, particularly by myself, for a university campus here in Barrie. Um, the reason I think that's so important, we are the largest city in the country without a university campus. Uh, we need a full range of skills training and professional uh, training opportunities for our kids. Uh, right now you're 17 when you go to university. Anybody got kids in university? <laughs> you know how expensive it is. Uh, they're 17 when they go. And both because of the cost and their relatively young age, a lot of families can't send their kids halfway across the country to university the way they used to. The cost is too high. They're too young to live on their own. If they don't get residence, it's a tough, a tough call. And if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. Uh, if we have those opportunities here in Barrie, I think more of our kids will be able to go to university. We have a tremendous community college here, one of the very, very best. And they have done remarkable things to start university education in Barrie through their partnership center. I think we, we need a full, broad range of education in Barrie, university, college, and the other piece which I think is hugely important is skills, skilled trades. One of the paradoxes for me um, in economic development over the last uh, two years has been to meet with manufacturer after manufacturer and have them say, I can't hire people. I can't get people. Well, what a weird situation here. We have relatively high unemployment and they're saying, I'm hiring from the Philippines or I'm hiring from the States because we don't, for some strange reason, uh, attract enough people into skilled trades education in this province or this country. Um, one statistic, Georgian College had 100 students in its CNC machining program when it started 10 years ago. That was their intake, 100 students. They could only get 30 this year. And yet, these kids are guaranteed a job on graduation. And they have a summer job, and the biggest problem they have in that program is that kids get hired after halfway through the program, they get hired after the program, and they don't go back. The, the company trains them, and they never finish. <laughs> so the spaces are going to be in the program. So we need to change our perception out there because for some reason we're not attracting our kids into those jobs and those jobs are there. They're there right here in Barrie. Um, Monroe Concrete, we're an amazing company. <laughs> Funny story there. They're the, anybody know them? They're the concrete company on Highway 90 just west of Barrie. They're in uh, Utopia. They couldn't get people. And they were advertising in Greater Toronto. And they were saying, come live in Utopia. <laughs> Does it get any better? Well, unfortunately, the problem they had was when people came up, they could see, yeah, there may be a job for me in Monroe Concrete, but what about my wife? And what about my husband? Uh, maybe there's going to be a job somewhere nearby, but I don't really know. So they started to say, we're in Barrie. And that helped a little. But they, uh, uh, last year, went to hire 100 more people, from steel workers to uh, master masons to heavy lift operators to pipe fitters. <laughs> And again, had to go cast their net hugely broadly to try and find people. They recruited them from all over Ontario and in some cases uh, from the East Coast. So that's something I know we can do as a community. If we have those broader education opportunities, we can help people get the jobs that are here. Uh, but I think we can also help train our workforce and that in turn will help us bring in more employment to the community. And I actually think that's probably the top issue for this community as a whole. Because I don't see us being a bedroom community. I never have. I think we're our own city, and we should be a place where there are enough jobs for everybody who wants to work here. Some people are always going to choose or have a job somewhere else, and some people are going to commute in and work in Barrie, go live in Innisfil or Midland or otherwise. But there should be enough opportunities that people don't have to commute out of town to find a good, solid, permanent job, particularly in, in industry. Um, a few other things that are going on. Uh, the planning for the annex lands. Uh, is um, moving very quickly. It's uh, actually on time um, and on budget. You know. uh, the, that effort is to plan for uh, the, the lands that were um, annexed and buried uh, three years ago, two and a half years ago. We, are, we have already established that we're going to grow much slower than we did in the past. And to my mind, that's critically important. I think. My own view on Barry is that we let growth get away from us. Um, growth is a good thing. It, it, if you stop growing, if you've ever been to a city that's not growing or shrinking, you know why growth is important. 
you need the city to move forward. You need to have a little bit bigger market for shops, services. Companies, if they're going to grow, if they're going to expand employment, you have to have a bigger market. Uh, but we don't need to grow at the pace that we were growing before because we let it get away from us. We couldn't keep up with the infrastructure needs. So as one example, last year, 2011, uh, we built uh, four new parks in the south end of Barrie. Uh, Ward 9, Ward 10, I think 2, and Ward 6. Um, those four parks, in some cases, were in neighborhoods that had been there for six or seven years and the park had been a dirt field the whole time. Parks are something, you could build a park for about a quarter of a million dollars with a proper playground and grass and so forth. A little bit more if you're going to do a, a full-size soccer pitch or a ball diving. We can get those projects done, even in this time of austerity, and it is a time of austerity for City Hall as with all other levels of government. But back to growth, what, what we are determined to do this time when we grow is to grow slower and smarter. Slower means probably about half the pace that we grew in the 90s and the past 10 years. Um, it means building neighborhoods where there actually are local shops and services. One of the principles we established, which is in the plan, is that everybody will be able to walk to a park. It'll be a park within 500 meters of all the residences in the new neighborhoods. Um, and that uh, on balance, the commercial and industrial lands that are built will not be designated for retail. We've got enough retail. Uh, we need more industrial land, we need more office land, we need attract more of those types of businesses and that's what we're planning for. So there is no new shopping district in the annex lands that's planned. There are local neighborhood plazas, which we know we're going to need. And we're probably going to need a couple more grocery stores, so there will be a grocery store or two uh, type thing. But no more power center or shopping center uh, type development because we don't believe we need that this time around. Uh, what more can I tell you? I, I, I can bore you with details of the budget if you're interested. I'm sure there are many uh, uh, issues that you would be more than uh, interested to hear about, though, in terms of our, our you know, water bills, uh, the, the uh, tax situation. Uh, anybody received their property assessment from MPAC yet? Yes? Yes. So, they're, yeah, they're just starting to, I heard just in the last couple of days, I've heard from people who got that notice in the mail. So, for those of you who don't know how it works, I'm sure most of you do. Uh, the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, which is a outsourced thing <laughs> that assesses all property in Ontario, they come and determine what they think your house is worth and send you a, an assessment note. Um, in, uh, on that notice it will say how much your property has gone up in value or changed in value. It's possible that it's decreased, but for just about everybody it's gone up. In Barrie, the average increase over four years was about 10%. If your assessment notice says your property went up by 10%, it won't affect your property taxes. So the way it works is if your uh, property increased in value by the same amount as the average, there's no impact on your taxes. If it's less, you will actually pay less property tax. If it's more, then you will probably pay more property tax. Uh, but that's the way it works in terms of that assessed value. And if you have questions about that, uh, we can help you get the answers when you get that notice in the mail. A lot of people see it and go, oh my God, 12%, I'm going to have to pay 12% more in taxes. No, not true. It's based on how much your property changed relative to the average. Uh, we go through this every four years and it generates a lot of calls to my office. <laughs> uh, and to City Hall. Can I have a question here, Jeff? What yes, sir. On Gallo Street, with the Oak Green Pie, is there taxes at the property? Be interesting to see what MPAC says. Uh, has anybody from Gallon Street got a notice yet? No, I'd be really interested to see what, what they say about that. Because, you know, I think um, on a couple of local issues, maybe I'll finish off with that. Because, you know, the GO station, the GO service, uh, first of all, it's nice to have weekend service, I think, this summer. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't get a lot of ridership except from Barrie. It's really interesting. I talked to the president back in late July and he said, Actually, we're getting great ridership out of Barrie, but all those other stops along the line, not so much. So not sure whether we're going to get it back next summer. I've been pushing him to say, well, you know what, this didn't get promoted at all. Like, let's promote it along with our tourist events, our festivals, get people coming up from Toronto uh, to go to the festivals. They won't have to park, all the rest of it, and it brings money into our community. So we'll see. But um, on, the, on the impact of the GO train, I think, um, and there's several of you here who uh, were at the meeting about the Cumberland Street redevelopment, 
Uh, I have heard rumblings about one or two others. I've heard that there are some properties out there that are being purchased. I don't know if that's true. We don't necessarily hear about that until somebody walks into City Hall and says, give me a building permit or give me a, here's a planning application or whatever it might be. But it, I am hearing about that now. And I suspect some of that is the impact of having a growth station there. Um, when it comes to what creates value in property, uh, my old school economist approach is you read a real estate ad and see what it says. Close to water, close to park, close to whatever. Close to go is in a lot of the real estate ads for Allendale. So there's got to be some value to it because people who sell houses think that there is. Uh, I tend to think there is too. I think on Gallon Street it's a lot more complex because you've got the trains right there, you're making a lot of noise very early in the morning, you've got a lot of parking, you've got all those things so to deal with. Too. We, we got two right behind your house. Two. There's seven engines and we got two right behind your house. Yeah, I can relate because that's the late, that's the late. So yeah. we have engines. Uh, Down, yeah, by the way. Yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah, you know, it's interesting. I asked them about that because they said, okay, you know, the train doesn't go until 5, whatever it is now. I think they just adjusted it, but 5.15, I think. Um, and apparently there's... They start them up really early to warm them up or something, and especially in the winter, I get calls from people on the other side of the lake, let alone you guys, who are right behind it. Right behind. Um, I don't have an easy answer for you on that, because the rail yard is there, and I don't think it's going anywhere. But to the extent that I can call it Metrolink and see if there's anything they can do. See what MPAC says, and if you don't agree with what MPAC says, there's a process for challenging it, and we can help you with that too, for what it's worth. Anyway, I think I'll leave it there, because my 15 minutes was more like 20, uh, and I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, but thank you very much for inviting me here uh, tonight. <laughs> Actually, I was in front of a bunch of uh, kindergarten kids uh, at Alamo Heights, uh, I don't know, May, I think, and I was talking to them about what I do. I was trying to explain what I do to a five-year-old. And I, you know, I've explained to my three-and-a-half-year-old daughter what I do. Daddy looks after roads and parks and your library that you go to and all of those things, and I go to a lot of meetings at City Hall. That's what she knows about my job. Uh, <laughs> but they, I was telling all these university, or, excuse me, yeah. <laughs> Future. Kindergarten kids, future university students, the class of 20, 2030, um, what, uh, what I do. So I was talking about police and fire, because little, little kids I thought might be most interested in that, and kind of what my role is in that. And I finished, and I said, are there any questions? And this little boy put his hand up, and without a word of a lie, what he said was, are you Batman? <laughs> Shine the light on me. Anyway, so. Um, you should have said you actually have a tougher job. That's right. Batman's job is easy. At least he's rich. <laughs> so, uh, if there are any questions I can answer, I'd be delighted to. And uh, thank you again for inviting me to be here. I wanted to know about, uh, you talked a lot about the GO train. I heard uh, about all day GO service. Yeah. And if you'd heard anything about that. Yeah. So here's what I know. The um, uh, Metrolinx had a, has a plan called the Big Move, which is all the improvements to the transportation network in the Greater Toronto Area. They have said they're going to go to all-day service on all their lines by 2021. So don't hold your breath, because uh, I think it's going to take time. The way Metrolinx works, um, one of the nice things is once you're established, once you've got the stations open and the layover yards there and the facilities are there, uh, it's very inexpensive for them to add trains. They just have to pay for a crew and the gas, which is why doing the weekend service was easy and you see them adjusting times and they've added a train to bury a fifth train already um, in recent times. So when will they start running all day? I don't know. My guess would be on our line, it will be later in that next eight, nine year period than earlier. I don't think we're going to see it in the next three, four, five years. Um, the reason I think that is because the, there are other lines that are busier. Um, our ridership at Barry is actually really, really good for a city our size. We have almost a thousand people a day that take that train, which is excellent, much higher than the forecasts. 
But compared to the Lakeshore line, for example, Oakville generates 7,000 riders a day, and they're not that much bigger than we are. So some of those Lakeshore uh, corridors, they have all the Lakeshore. Uh, the Milton line as well is really, really busy through Brampton, Mississauga, Milton. I, if I had to bet, I'd say they might get it before we do. So. We will fairgrounds property. Yeah. So, um, no is the short version. Uh, we, I had Handy uh, Crawlis, our head of economic development, give them a call recently. Uh, they, I understand, have been competing with Park Place for tenants. Um, they have made no move yet to uh, file a site, uh, or not a site plan, but building permit applications. They've demolished, obviously, just about everything there, including the Bilbis over the summer. Um, I don't know is the short version. They seem to be waiting on a key tenant or something like that before they build. Oh. I was wondering, Jeff, if it's possible that that property could, could be considered for university. It, it's, it would actually be absolutely ideal. Um, Osmington paid $29 million for it, so there's no way we're going to pay $29 million for a university um, um, site. Um, maybe a university would, uh, but I kind of doubt it. I think th the problem is it's got retail zoning. It's had retail zoning since the mid-80s. Those of you who went through the site plan with me as counselor will remember that that was one of the issues, right? It, it, even though it was operating as a racetrack and the Ag Society owned it, it had commercial zoning right from the 80s, which makes it really, really valuable land, like much, much more expensive than probably a university would pay. So uh, it's a, it's a, and it's a great spot from a traffic point of view, but not sure we would get the greatest benefit as a city from having it on, uh, on a site like that. Um, I've made no secret of my preference for it being in uh, or around the downtown uh, because I have watched Kitchener, Cambridge, Oshawa, uh, Brantford all revitalize their downtowns with satellite university campuses. You absolutely have to get the housing issue right off the top. That is the biggest, biggest mistake that cities make. They go, oh great, we got a university campus, and they never think about where all the students are going to live. We've had our own challenges in the East End Barry, lots of university cities have had town and gown. There are some who haven't, and they are, including uh, Sudbury, where Laurentian is, they just opened a new residence. Part of their secret has been they provide residence spaces for the vast majority of their students. So if you plan it right from the beginning, I think you can address some of those issues. So we'll see. What are the, the next step or steps and the timeline uh, with regard to the train station buildings and the property there? Yeah. So um, everybody knows about our legal challenge. Um, I can update you on that. Uh, we were in court, uh, filed our statement of defense in spring. We were finally in court on August 7th. And actually, I, because I thought I might get asked that tonight, I asked for the details and I want to make sure I get them right since Paul's filming me. <laughs> I would want to get them right anyway. Um, hang on just a second. Okay, so. service a list of 12 witnesses that it wanted to examine on the CPL. The CPL is the Certificate of Pending Litigation. It is what is keeping us from entering into a long-term arrangement for the use of those buildings. I'll say more on that in a minute because it doesn't mean we can't use them. But. Uh, Barry brought a motion for court direction, uh, sorry, CGI, the other side, served a list of 12 witnesses that it wanted uh, to examine on the motion. That, in our opinion, was a delay tactic uh, to stretch it out, make it a bigger affair, uh, we challenged that, and in court we won on 11 of those 12 motions. Each one of them was, was a separate, each one of the witnesses was a separate motion. We won on 11 of 12, and in fact, the city barrier is awarded costs. Okay? <laughs> that being said, <laughs> that was just the first skirmish, I'm afraid. Um, but. You know, it was a good start for us, and, and frankly, given the situation, which we're all very unhappy with, um, it was a good outcome. 
Uh, the CPL, the Certificate of Pending Litigation, uh, does not mean we can't use the buildings. It just means that anybody who we enter into an agreement with has to accept the fact that there's a constraint on title uh, for the building that could affect its future use if we were to lose the suit that the building was to be involved in. So my own opinion is we need an interim use in there sooner than later. If this is going to drag on, unfortunately it seems to be possible that that's the case. Um, we need to uh, look at something in the building in the interim because I think we would like to see something happen there. And uh, I think there is a potential uh, for us to use the building for any number of different um, uses in the short term. There's absolutely nothing keeping us from actually bringing tenants in there and going right ahead with it. But um, uh, it, we, we have not done so because we were hoping to clear the certificate through the court process over the summer. With the delay tactics, the speed of the justice system, unfortunately, it's taking longer. So what I want to do now, Mike, and I've talked to our new CAO about this, is can we put something in there for a couple of years? Could we get a coffee shop up and running? Could we get an ice cream stand up and running for the people going around the bay? Could we get a, a, some, at least get all this incredible memorabilia? So one of the really amazing byproducts of, of restoring that building, Lauren's laughing because she knows what I'm going to tell you. We, one of the amazing things about this process of restoring this building is it, all the old railroaders, particularly in Allendale, mm -hmm. came to us and said, I've got this from my grandfather, my dad who used to work on it, or when I was working on the railway. Do you want it for the, a museum? Do you want to display it in the train station once it's been fixed up? And the most amazing one for me was a 91-year-old woman uh, who actually lives at the IWF now, uh, called me one day and said, I've got all this stuff, I, and I'd like to give it to the city. Um, and, uh, would, you know, would you be interested? So I went to her apartment, and um, she, just this, these cases and cases of stuff, great stuff, uh, plates, commemorative plates, commemorative silver, all this kind of stuff uh, related to uh, the railway at Old Allendale. Um, and then boxes and boxes of scrapbooks from, uh, in some cases, 100 years old, 100 year old uh, newspaper articles and things. So there's this huge wealth of, of heritage that we traditionally in Barrie we've knocked down our historic buildings, and it's such a shame. And that one, that one finally, we did. And yeah, it cost a lot to restore it, and it's going to cost even more to get it done. But it is worth it. That is one of the three most beautiful buildings in the city of Barrie. It is completely unique. And I'm really, really eager to get in there and get us using it in some way for, for public use. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, the Cumberland Street yep. uh, development, that's a big, uh, big present thing for a lot of us in the area. Yep. Um, and we're also concerned we don't have a representative in that now. Sure. So going to vote soon. Um, our main concern, like, we're very concerned about this five story. Issue yeah. this building, and, and particularly for the precedence that it sets. That now you have this beautiful old Allendale neighborhood, the historic Allendale area. That you know anyone can. I think Bill mentioned this at City Hall there a couple weeks ago. That now that just opens up the gate for someone else to come along and buy a few parcels of land and say, "Well, there's a five-story building there. We're going to see if we can get a variance now for seven, or yeah. you know, and all and." And so we we went to we uh, we fought a, a development behind us all of us here uh, on one oh, one Milton yeah. So we went to the OMB, yeah. and although we lost the the rezoning, we were very successful in shrinking the building. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the ruling from the OMB was three stories. Yeah. So I was really surprised when the developer that night in his presentation said, "Oh, I'm aware of that file. I have that file with me." That he wouldn't have advised his client that well, gee, they, the O and B ruled that three stories was the maximum for that spot. So, so anyways, we're very, very concerned about them, about that development, that size, that you know, that height, that amount of traffic, and, and so on. And not only what it means for us immediately, of course, but then down the road we start seeing this happening. You know, I know you're talking about you know growth and. Very important for a city to grow and have yeah. a mandate to intensify. <coughs> but it, you know, again, when I read that historic uh, strategy, and we were called a red street, which meant basically addition, single story, you know, yeah. that type of thing. So that's a real big concern for us. Right? Sure. And you, your comments at the public meeting were great. And um, also, I have to compliment the neighborhood association. I actually, just put up a blog entry 
uh, about a friend of mine who died last year, a guy named Larry Taylor, some of you may remember him, uh, who's a huge believer in community associations. And he believed in community associations because of the letters, letters like the one that Bill and Don or whoever else contributed to that letter wrote um, about that development. Because, you know, it said we're not against it redeveloping, it's a good thing if it redevelops, but you can't set this precedent on height, please preserve the mature trees, it's about the character of our neighborhood. That's what neighborhood associations are all about. And that's much more constructive than just coming and saying, don't do anything, right? So I think, um, yeah, my, I agree with you about the, the precedent issue and, you know, kind of where it is. I think my own view on density is you put it where people can walk to a lot of stuff and where um, the, on a, you know, a busier street is a place for higher density, right? Um, what I will say about that site is because it backs on the commercial lots at Burton, I think if they'd done a little more creative design, you could have they could have fit it into the neighborhood uh, better, and still maybe even had like four stories, for example, at the back, dropping it to say two at the front, right. and or gable the roof or something. Right. Then it fits with the other homes on the street. It fits with what's across the street a little more, something like that. And uh, which gets to my broader kind of view on <coughs> intensification in on small streets like that, especially in established neighborhoods. Design is so critical. If you put the effort in to try and you know, match it up as best as possible with the character of the area, then I think intensification can actually be done quite well. Um, where you don't, it, it's a problem. So I'm not sure where that one will go, actually, in terms of our staff and their, their view on it. Um, I think when you back onto the Monda Burton, you know, at the back of that site, if there's going to be density, that's where I, I'd say is okay. But up on the street, particularly, could you do something that matches the historic? So the other trick there is access. Like, you know, our, we're on a dead end. Yeah. Cumberland is very, like, again, one of those residential streets where kids play and so on. Exactly. And they're only going to have one entrance, one exit yeah. on Cumberland. It's a shame that it's not connected to uh, through to the Are the traffic stays down? Uh, is it 40, 40, 48? I think between the two buildings it would be, there would be for 20, 53, 53. 53. So that's a heck of a lot of vehicles. Right? Yeah, so that's our tip, our standard is one and a half vehicles, so you'd have up to 80. Um, and yeah, probably we would require them to do traffic. I don't know, I'm just trying to remember the details of it. We just had the public meeting, so what happens now is our staff look at all of these issues, and then they report back to us with their analysis of what the issues might be. The question I got to you is the sewers, the water mains, yep. the lots of that type of uh, uh, building feet. Yep. Now, who puts a bill in Carmel Street because they all tore up the new services and everything else? Yep. Who ends up with the bill? So if they, um, they'll have to pay development charges, even though they're in the Allendale CIP, they'll pay 50%. Actually, in the Allendale CIP, they'll pay 100 so if there were work, if there was work that had to be done, they would pay several hundred thousand dollars towards that work. Um, and in fact, if the work doesn't have to be done, they have to contribute that anyway towards the broader costs of infrastructure in the city. Uh, we would not allow them to build if there wasn't capacity. But to your point, you know, say that happened, or a project like it or some reduced version, then it's gonna be more people on that site than there was before if there's if it's approved in some form. If there was some others on the street and you hit the tipping point where the pipe wasn't big enough, yeah, that's when you'd have to do it. We would not allow that unless the work could be done before it was occupied. You can't anymore build. I'll give you a, another example that's very similar in my old board. Eccles Street North. Everybody knows Eccles Street from Wellington to Dunlop. But you don't maybe see too often is Eccles Street North, which is a little stub that goes into the hill. Uh, towards Highway 400. There's about 15 houses on that street, and for everybody who lived there over the years, they could never take a shower if a bunch of their neighbors were taking a shower. Because they had a water pipe. Uh, they, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. They had to, if everybody was in the shower at 7 in the morning, you got to trickle out of the shower. It was unbelievable. Um, but it was built in the post war period, I think it was built in maybe the 50s or 60s, those homes would have gone in. And they just didn't. They didn't really plan for that stuff at that time. 
So, you know, we try and learn from these things over the years. Certainly now you can never get a, a building permit on a street that doesn't have the capacity. But Rich Bay was mentioned before to me. Oh, there you go. The already been changed to Wild Street all tore up. Yeah. But even at the present moment, you have trouble with water running down your driveway and a real head. Oh, you should yeah. The storm water, you mean? Storm yeah. water. Yeah, storm water. And that's actually another big issue, uh, particularly in all of our older neighbors. I forgot, have you got drains? you get storm drains on uh, Carmelander? Yeah, okay. Well, that's good anyway, uh, but it sounds like the system's not working so well. So, you know, um, and that's something I can have our guys come out and look at. But the there's parts of the city that were actually built in a period of time and we didn't even build storm drains. In the east end, there's uh, areas where it's backyard ditches. It actually runs along the property line. Everybody's backyard floods every spring for a while. And it repeats again. Representing that area is a lot of fun, too. Sir, you're with me. They're elevating manholes on Wilgate Street, and I noticed in a previous article in the paper that Wilgate uh, was the last street was identified as microservicing potential, and I'm just wondering, is that the first step, or? Um, we're elevating the manhole covers to try and damage people's cars. <laughs> um, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't actually know that. I believe that is exactly that would be exactly why that's the case. If we're actually, are they painted orange yet? With the little orange strip on the front of them? No. They're, they're like that on Hogan? They yeah, have red, that's... Like blue paint on, on oh, yeah. the manual Okay, I, I'd have to check what the plan is, but it's really likely that's the case. Either a microsurfacing or a pave and shave. Shave and pave. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So the kids want to know when you're going back down the other <laughs> So, uh, a couple things. Um, first thing, um, I, I was asked to pass this on um, by students and seniors. Um, great job with the rec, uh, with the Allendale Rec Center, with the upgrades. Didn't that look great? Yeah, it looks great. It looks great. It was a brand new sauna. But the shower is a brand new place. It's a brand new sauna. Um, yeah. But even beyond that, the, the youth programs and the affordability of those those uh, after school drop ins um, with the with the night, night youth program and, and the investment into having more affordable uh, the dollar uh, dollar fee yeah dollar absolutely dollar fantastic dollar yeah, days, yeah absolutely fantastic and we're starting to see some growth in those programs so hopefully that continues but um, so I want to say a great job on that. Um, it's nice to see that the rec centers that are older are, are, are getting some of the much deserved attention that they need. Um, second thing, um, you mentioned uh, the university, which um, not opposed to, but I have a few concerns about it. Sure. Um, being close to this neighborhood um, and you know, some of the problems that we've seen in the East End with, with Georgian, um, I wonder what happens to the property value. Okay. Um, so that's number one. Um, secondly, I'm wondering if there's any uh, announcement coming soon about um, any partnership deals uh, with the Barry Central um, uh, Laurentian University within the Barry Central location, Red Story Field, Prince of Wales, and perhaps the three uh, housing properties that are there. Is that the plan, or? So, uh, watch your newspaper in a couple of days. Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> um, we've been working very, very hard with the school board at the staff level for six, seven months now. Um, they've been great, actually. This relationship wasn't too good, and that, frankly, is partly my fault because we really punched back at closing that high school. There's no question. It was a fight. Uh, thankfully, the trustees saw it our way. Uh, gave it a four-year lease on life to try and find partners to keep it open. Um, I think that's hugely important. So uh, we're hoping that there's more to say soon. There's no announcement coming about the universities coming to Barry in a few days or anything, but let me tease you that or anything like that. But, but we're getting somewhere on a couple of things, and you should be able to say more hopefully later this week, maybe, maybe early next week. Um, but the uh, philosophy is that um, the partnerships, whatever happens there, and whether it ultimately is considered, whether Barry gets a university or not, whether it becomes a site for a university or not, because the university may not want to go there. Let's, let's not 
told me are. <laughs> um, it, it, um, the, whatever partnership happens there uh, has to include the rebuild of a high school. And um, what we have been trying to do is cast our net very, very widely and say, uh, what are all the potential combinations that could make a great project happen there, whether or not we get, we, we get a university. Because that could be one very central piece, pardon the pun, um, between Red Story Field, the high school, Prince of Wales, uh, the old fire hall uh, site as well in the area. Um, and certainly I don't think anybody would argue that Bradford Street could use some help. It's got lots of sites for potential redevelopment um, and, you know, that, that's one potential. So, um, on, the, on the Laurentian side, uh, Laurentian committed $14 million to building a campus in Barrie. Council said we would match that if they are the successful university and Barrie gets, a, gets the campus. Uh, it will be up to the ranch and where they want to go. And that process, you know, would only unfold after we know whether Barry is going to be the city, because there's lots of other cities that, that want it. But um, I would say, compared to six months ago or a year ago, uh, we are working very, very well now with the school board. And um, I think the uh, other partners have all committed to potentially being there, even if a university is not. So, say we didn't get a campus, and say, or say the university decided they want to go somewhere else, Hospital or the Annex Lands, or who knows. Um, there is interest from uh, the YMCA, there is interest from Virgin College, there is interest from a number of private developers, and there has got to be a way with those different pieces of land in those locations to get money contributed towards a brand new high school um, and a great project down there. Uh, so, I'm, I'm really I'm pretty optimistic, but you know, hopefully a little bit more to say really soon. Okay. okay. Just uh, I guess the, the piece uh, about um, property value. Oh, property value. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So the housing strategy, if if a university is to go into an area where, like into an existing or part of the city, wherever it goes, there has to be a housing strategy from the outset that is based on providing residence spaces for the majority of students. Um, one of the things to remember about a satellite campus in Barrie is the whole point of it would be to create access for kids who live here in Simcoe County. Georgian College, although they do have a lot of student housing around the college, the majority of their students are commuters. Um, there would be, I think, in a university a significant chunk of kids who live uh, at home and go to the school. The universities generally know how many that is. The idea would be can we provide residence spaces for everyone else, so you don't end up with a need for off-campus student help. I'm not going to try and tell you that there wouldn't be some. There would be some. If we did it right, and, worked, and the university committed to us from the outset, then I think it could be planned for and managed well. And don't forget as well, around a lot of universities, there are neighborhoods where a lot of the faculty and staff live, and that really brings up the property values in those areas too. So it's not all negative because it all goes to rent. Um, and remember, there's grad students and lots of kids in different stages. I mean, if you look at Kingston, uh, you've got a three or four block area that's a nightmare. And then you've got about a 10 and a 15 block area that's beautiful. And a lot of it is student faculty housing. So it's all about how you manage it. Try to get some people who haven't been asked before. I was wondering what this yeah. building, condos and stuff, on, right on the lake shore, if there's, I don't know. Many, quite a few tall ones. Oh, Harmony Village. Yeah. <laughs> We're like cutting off our nose. Like, right. you can only build so it's a fairly short circle around Lakeshore. Yeah. Where if they could be made to build them back on Ann Street, mm -hmm. or that distance back, we could build a lot more and probably collect a lot more tax money. Yeah, so, I mean. Sorry, where, where the Where the Lakeshore is just getting so intense right now. <laughs> Huge building, we're going to lose it. Yeah, I think. Well, um, first of all, I would say that the one development site that remains on the waterfront chunk between downtown and Allendale is that Harmony Village site. So I'll say a bit about that in a second. In terms of the rest of the waterfront, um, you know, there's a big debate right now over this piece of this 75 feet of Bayview Park that the adjoining 
wants to slice off you could, you know. Um, council on Monday night sent that back to staff and said, we want it to remain as parkland uh, with a piece, you know, maybe you can do underground parking under it or something like that, but they want it to remain as parkland. The Harmony Village site is five or six acres, I believe. Um, it is the last remaining big site on the, on the right, right on the waterfront. And the piece that's on the waterfront is actually not very big. It's that space between the Eco Park and Number Two Toronto Street. It, the site is actually very odd shape. It's got a chunk that comes out to the waterfront, and then it opens up a little bit back on Bradford. Is that the old French Moors? Uh, no, it's very Metro Glass, and uh, the piece beside it. So, and they've got a little access off of uh, Checkers Street, which is that little stuff that goes up to the, uh, I think it's the TSH office, used to be TSH. Anyway, so um, that site, those of you who will remember Blue Sales, the previous big development proposal there, the guys who bought that site five years ago said, uh, we want to build four towers on the site, 16 stories tall, the same height as the other ones, right? That's kind of our standard for what we've allowed. And uh, I really didn't like that. Because um, then we were going to have 10 towers, all the same height, and there was really clustered into that area. You'd have eight of them kind of packed in, in between Victoria and Silver Street. So we talked to them and said, well, and the residents of 2 Toronto Street were furious because the one building was going to go even closer to their building than their other, the twin building on their own complex. <laughs> it's going to be right next door. So we said, um, if you were allowed to build higher, could you build fewer towers? Because then we, would, we wouldn't have as many. And uh, if they built back on Bradford Street, the height back there didn't bother me as much as the height right up front by the water. And ultimately, uh, what they were approved for was two 24-story buildings. So that was a precedent setting. That's much higher than anything else we allowed. But to my mind, that was better than four 16-story towers. People have different opinions about that. My view is, and they, the other thing they said they would do is a signature building. So the architecture of the front one was actually was a curved building. It was quite unusual looking. Um, so fast forward, uh, they got their approval, didn't go anywhere. A recession happened. They sold the site or these new guys have secured it. And Harmony Village comes along and says, well, we want to build four or five 24 story buildings. <laughs> So, uh, I can tell you already that in my discussions with them, I have expressed my opinion that that's much too aggressive. Uh, that um, I, although I welcome a seniors oriented uh, complex on that site, we had already done something unprecedented in terms of height to allow the two buildings previously. Uh, so, I think the question is now, they've picked their architect, they went through this design competition, uh, they picked their architect. They have not made a planning application to the city. So anything that happens with Army Village is going to go through this process, public process, which hasn't even started yet. What they've done so far is had an architectural competition for their design. But um, it'll all come to council. Um, I think with a site that big, uh, or a site with a proposal that big, one of the biggest problems you've got on the waterfront is you can't do any underground parking. So you end up with this huge garage that the architects kind of try and mask by having townhouses on it or, you know, green roof or something like that. It just, it, like if you looked at those concepts, several of them, just massive parking garage, really bulky and not, to my mind, the optimal. So anyway, all of which to say, I think if they get the message, they'll come in with something maybe a little more modest. I think it's a great um, concept to have a seniors-oriented development in that location, I think uh, the, uh, some of the other elements of the proposal are actually really exciting. They want to do a senior center, an activity center as part of it. They want to do retail shops on Bradford Street. Um, I think it will improve the whole area, but I want to see it come back a little less aggressive than I It's worse than I think once, like if you're back on Ann Street, once you're above the tree line, you'd have a great view of the bay. Yeah, that apartment at Ann and Dunlop, actually, everybody above but the third floor has, has now but we, we when you're on end, you can't really walk to stuff downtown. Where you can, it's a long yeah. walk. Bradford Street, I think, is is not a bad spot. I think it needs the help. It's just we're building a wall, I think. 
for anyone. Well, and that's yeah. But yeah. So that's one of the reasons I didn't want the four, <clears throat> and why I would be looking for them to cut back a fewer towers. And different.